Hello, I'm Christina Wyckoff. I'm the Section 106 Coordinator and Historical Archaeologist here at the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office. Welcome to this OK Shippo Lunch and Learn presentation. Today, I am so excited to be joined by Kenneth Seivard, Seivard. Sorry, Cybered, who is an OHS board of direct on the OHS board of directors and also an author. Kenneth is a sixth generation McCurtain County native. He joined the McCurtain County Historical Historical Society at age 15 and was elected to the society's board of directors at 17 and elected president of the organization in 2009. He received the society's Distinguished Service Award in 2007. Working with the Society, he's created education programs, including a Choctaw Heritage Festival. He assisted Dr. Lewis Stiles in marking the Choctaw Trail of Tears route across McCurtain County. He also worked with the Research Division of the Oklahoma Historical Society to arrange for the donation of 7,000 historical photographs. He's the co-author of the book Images of McCurtain County and has written more than 25 articles on the historical topics for the McCurtain Gazette and Oklahoma Edge magazine. Syverd is active in preservation and restoration efforts in downtown Idabel and on behalf of the Barnes-Stevenson House in Idabel and Howell, Harris Mill and Waterhole Cemeteries. He worked for the OHS at Fort Towson Historical at the Fort Towson Historic Site and at Honey Springs Battlefield and is the finance manager for the James Hodge Auto Group. And today his presentation is Masonic Lodges in Oklahoma. Thank you so much, Kenny, for being here. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Christina. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here and I want to uh, uh, begin with my thanks to the uh, SHPO office for um, not only uh, allowing us to highlight some of the Masonic history of our state in this program, but also for uh, these regular programs that you guys bring to the table for the people of Oklahoma. Uh, this is just a, a valuable resource and, and uh, I'm very thankful for the work that you guys do. And, uh, and uh, guys, if, if you're not familiar with the State Historic Preservation Office uh, housed there in the Oklahoma History Center, um, they offer a, a wide range of benefits to the people of the state of Oklahoma, and uh, they've got some of the most dedicated staff that you could find anywhere. So we're very fortunate to have them, <clears throat> and uh, I'm very thankful for you guys. So let me get started here. Um, uh, right off the bat, um, I want to uh, kind of explain uh, how I'm approaching today's topic. Um, you know, Masonic Lodges in Oklahoma, that, that covers such a wide range uh, of history, of historic eras, uh, and especially here in Oklahoma, where we have such a diverse and unique history. It, it covers a lot of different ethnic and social backgrounds, uh, even religious backgrounds, and uh, so there, there's a wide, wide road that we could walk here. Um, but in approaching this, this uh, uh, program here today, uh, I want to explain that the, the way that I'm approaching this today is just to familiarize um, the people watching or I taking part. I think we lost you for just a second there, but I, I see you again. Maybe we'll switch off the camera and see if the audio is better. You bet. I can guarantee you one thing. It'll look better with this camera off anyway. All right. Can you hear me now, Christina? I can. Awesome. Good deal. Um, so uh, as I was saying, we, the way I'm approaching this program today is just to familiarize the person uh, partaking in this program uh, with the basic history of Masonic Lodges in uh, our state and lodges as a building. Um, you know, we're going to pepper in some Masonic history and everything, of course, to, to explain uh, what Masonic Lodge is. Uh, the transformations that our lodges have taken over the years, but uh, uh, we're also going to be highlighting the lodges as they are a space in our communities. And so with that being said, we'll uh, start off with Masonic Lodges in Indian Territory. Now, 
Um, the story of masonry in Oklahoma, as with any of the history of Oklahoma, is just extraordinarily um, deep and diverse. Um, for instance, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with our fraternity and the way it's set up, you're going to hear a lot of talk today uh, in, during this presentation uh, about a Grand Lodge. And you, you may not be familiar with what that is. A Grand Lodge is basically a, uh, uh, a governing body, usually on a state or territorial level um, that is kind of like uh, uh, the state organization for our fraternity. And uh, Oklahoma uh, has had many Grand Lodges operating within its current boundaries. Um, most of the lodges in Indian Territory um, were chartered out of the Grand Lodge of the state of Arkansas. Um, there's been uh, a couple of uh, exemptions to that. One lodge uh, chartered out of the Grand Lodge of, of Kansas, for instance. But most of our early Masonic lodges were chartered out of the state of Arkansas. Now, um, later on, there's a Grand Lodge of Indian Territory that develops um, where these lodges become more independent, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But the very first Masonic Lodge chartered in our state uh, was uh, Cherokee Lodge at Tahlequah in the Cherokee Nation, uh, chartered in 1848. And uh, the building that you see here uh, was their lodge hall that was built in the early 1850s in order to, to uh, uh, house that Masonic Lodge's uh, meetings. So it is a uh, good example of a basic structure of what a Masonic Lodge would have looked like in uh, Indian Territory, in, in the Indian Nations. Uh, this photo comes to us uh, courtesy of Oklahoma Masonic History by uh, T.S. Akers. T.S. Akers is a, uh, a very accomplished uh, historian and really was probably the best person to give this, this presentation that I'm about to give. He uh, uh, does a lot of great research, and I urge you that if you're interested in this sort of thing or interested in, in diving further in any of the things that I mentioned today, um, go on by and like his Facebook page, uh, Oklahoma Masonic History by T.S. Akers. He is also on the board of directors of the Oklahoma Historical Society, and there's lots of great information on, on that page that he shares with us. Um, so, like I said, here is a, uh, a, an example of what a lodge in Indian Territory uh, would have and might have looked like, this one being the Cherokee Masonic Lodge. Um, now, later, in uh, 1874, um, lodges in, from within the Indian nations met at Caddo, um, present-day Oklahoma, then uh, Caddo, Choctaw Nation, Indian Territory. And uh, they forged together to uh, make the Grand Lodge of Indian Territory. And there were uh, several lodges uh, chartered under the Grand Lodge of Indian Territory. They continued to operate under the Grand Lodge of Indian Ter Territory's jurisdiction until February 1909. This photo is the interior of the uh, Masonic Lodge at Colbert. Um, and it is a wonderful photo because um, we have some photos like of Cherokee Lodge, some other lodges from uh, the Indian nations uh, during the Indian Territory era, but not very many from inside of the lodges. And this is one of them and, and the best one that I have ever laid eyes on. Again, this photo comes from us, from uh, Brother T.S. Akers. And you'll, you'll notice uh, the structure of the inside of, of this building. It's a uh, very simple structure uh, built specifically for the needs of the fraternity and how we meet and how we station our officers. Um, you'll notice too uh, something that's interesting to me as I look at this photo uh, every time I wonder about that stove there. You see how it's offset and it has the uh, uh, exhaust if you will coming up through the middle of the room. I've always wondered about the history of this particular building but I've not uh, ever been able to, to uh, properly research it if this was a repurposed building uh, for Masonic Lodge because obviously uh, for my many Mason uh, counterparts out there listening today you uh, uh, you know that uh, 
uh, stove pipe going up to the middle of the lodge isn't a, a, the greatest of designs. So I've, I've always wondered at that photo if, if this building was uh, originally something else and was repurposed as a Masonic lodge. But here's a probably the best photo of an Indian Territory lodge uh, taken from the interior that you're you're going to come across. These two photos here, just another example of Indian Territory lodges. This one coming up into the uh, late 1800s. Uh, the building on the left, that really crude uh, photo there is of the Goodwater Masonic Lodge located in Goodwater, Choctaw Nation, Indian Territory. It was chartered in 19, uh, 1898, excuse me. Um, this is my home lodge, so you'll see quite a few photos of, <laughs> of this here today because it, it does fit in with the many examples of Masonic lodges that, that we'll be going through. Um, uh, again, this building was was built in 1898 specifically to house um, that Masonic Lodge. Uh, it also served as a meeting place for the Woodmen of the World uh, ch uh, chapter there in Goodwater. And this is a, a common occurrence, and you'll you'll see it throughout today's uh, presentation, where other fraternal bodies would also uh, rent space or borrow space from these early Masonic lodges in order to be able to, to hold their meetings. Uh, to the right, you see the interior of that same building gives you an idea of, of uh, outside versus inside and, and what the historic volume of these buildings uh, would have looked like. So another major development to happen in Freemasonry in, in the state of Oklahoma that, that shaped our lodges and what our lodges look like and how they function is the creation of the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma Territory. This was done in uh, November of 1892. So these would have been um, lodges in the Oklahoma Territory, uh, of course, west of the Indian Territory. And uh, they, they, of course, share a, um, an, an awesome history and, and again, adds to the uh, uh, patchwork that, that is uh, masonry in Oklahoma and adds to the many Grand Lodges who have operated within the, the uh, state lines of, of Oklahoma as well. Um, the building that you see on the right there, that is the Masonic Lodge at Rush Springs, uh, Rush Springs Masonic Lodge. Uh, that building was built in 1894. Now this is two years after the creation of the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma Territory. And uh, it gives a good example of the transition that is beginning in these more populated uh, areas and, and even some of these more uh, wealthy areas. This is the transition you begin to see from these old wooden uh, buildings, uh, some of them on the outskirts of town, uh, where masonry is coming into to front and center and is affecting the landscape of, of developing towns or already established towns in their downtown areas. This is um, the era where we begin to see uh, uh, brick and mortar. Um, Masonic Lodge buildings coming up. Some of these buildings are going to be shared spaces with, with uh, other fraternal orders. They're going to be uh, shared spaces with uh, uh, even uh, 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 businesses as some lodges either uh, rent their lodge space or rent out space from their lodge building. Uh, some of them will have um, their their lodge uh, space in the second floor of a building or in the first floor, or some cases in the third floor, and rent out the other floors of the buildings for income, and so on and so forth. Each lodge is, is different, and, and each lodge's history is just as unique as a person's might be. But, so you had the formation of uh, the Grand Lodge of Indian Territory in 1874. You had the formation of the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma Territory in 1892. And those two um, Grand Lodges operated alongside each other until February of 1909, when the two lodges merged together and created the Grand Lodge of the state of Oklahoma. And during this time, Masonry and Oklahoma was on the move. The Masonic fraternity was growing. It was uh, starting on an uptick. As I said earlier, they were 
uh, starting to establish themselves physically and in more prominent areas. Uh, uh, um, you know, when you picture your old downtown uh, Masonic building, uh, many of them, this is the beginning of the era when they uh, begin to construct those buildings. On the left, you'll see um, a photo of the, the uh, uh, Hayworth Bank building in Hayworth, Oklahoma, Curtin County, Oklahoma. Uh, the second, that building was actually owned by the Hayworth Masonic Lodge. It was rented to the bank. Um, there were uh, a doctor's office, a uh, barber's office also rented out uh, from this building, among other businesses, and their lodge space occupied a portion of the second floor of that building and uh, the they stayed in that building until 1963 the building on the right is uh, the uh, car CPA building um, uh, North Central Street in Idabel Oklahoma that building is constructed in 1913 by the Idabel Masonic Lodge to house their new building again a massive uh, three-story structure uh, one of the tallest uh, uh, buildings in downtown Idabel, which makes it one of the tallest buildings in uh, in any downtown in southeast Oklahoma, or, or far southeast Oklahoma, I should say. Um, now I understand there's a lot of you who who uh, uh, classify uh, McAllister as southeast Oklahoma, and it is, I guess, geologically, but. Um, for us far down southeasterners here, that's still two hours north of us. But uh, uh, so we begin to see the change of uh, Masonic lodges, uh, what they look like, how they're functioning, and where they're located. And of course, this has an impact on the landscape of, of local communities, uh, landscape of the downtown areas uh, of towns. That Throughout the state of the new state, get this to turn. All right. Here are some more examples of uh, uh, these downtown buildings that begin to pop up throughout the state of Oklahoma. On the left is the Chickasha Masonic Lodge in Chickasha, Oklahoma. This uh, photo was taken last year. This building is still in use. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, there, there are still uh, some of these. Um, uh, old downtown Masonic building still in use, which is fantastic. Uh, the building on the right is the uh, Lodge Hall in Atoka that uh, has the Oklahoma Lodge number four uh, for several decades. Uh, it is now the home of Rebus Place in Atoka. Um, so we see the, the transformation uh, of these lodges over time. And, um, now, here is a, uh, another concept of Masonic Lodges in the state of Oklahoma. So when you say a Masonic Lodge in, in Oklahoma, it can mean a, a variety of things. Uh, one such example is a, a Masonic Temple at Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, this building was built in 1925. Uh, the architect for the building, uh, Jewel Hicks, he was a uh, student under Solomon Layden, the uh, architect of the uh, Oklahoma State Capitol building, as well as over a hundred other uh, public buildings. Um, Jewel Hicks also was a great architect in his own right. Uh, this building features, and I'll say features because it's still standing and still in use, a uh, theater that was originally uh, available for uh, outside use and rental and a uh, place to uh, uh, host everything from um, plays uh, to showers and, and weddings and different events. Um, it not only houses uh, Muskogee Masonic Lodge, but it also has rooms where the Order of the Eastern Star and uh, York Rite of Masonry bodies uh, meet. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful building. It's got an amazing experiencing a, a boom in membership. It was uh, starting to really pick up steam and expand here in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, uh, these buildings that grew out of that time period are testaments of, of that growth and that movement. Um, and that'll come into play later on as well as we see the waning of that, that growth in, in membership. Um, also, along the same time, of course, a building like this 
usually you're going to find uh, that those were constructed in a more populated area, uh, an area that has a better financial infrastructure than, say, um, somewhere like, uh, you know, Guyman, Oklahoma, or um, somewhere like Poto, Oklahoma. You would find these sort of grand structures more so in places uh, like Muskogee, of course, but also like the uh, Scottish Rite Temple in um, McAllister, which um, also hosts a Masonic Lodge within its walls. Um, and of course, the, the uh, Scottish Rite Temple in, in Guthrie. But another one was the uh, uh, Scott, the uh, Masonic Temple in downtown Oklahoma City. Um, this housed the Oklahoma City Lodge. Uh, it was built in 1923. Um, familiar architects, if, if you read that uh, bottom right-hand photo, uh, some of the architects that worked on this building, of course, uh, Solomon Layton again, and also uh, my man Jewel Hicks mentioned there. Um, and uh, the, the, this building uh, served for a great many years before being abandoned for a more modern building, which began to be the story statewide. As the membership of the Masonic Fraternity in Oklahoma began to uh, wane and go on a downward uh, trajectory in the 1950s, uh, these buildings, these grand buildings, as you can imagine, the upkeep of these things was uh, astronomical and not even uh, not limited to uh, buildings on this grand scale like in Oklahoma City or in uh, Muskogee but uh, even for your smaller Masonic lodges scattered throughout the state um, housed in those uh, old downtown buildings um, you know, it, the, some of these buildings were, were built in the 1910s, some of them in the 1920s. So by the end of the 1950s, you're needing things like window replacements. You're needing new roofs. Um, and also, you couple that with a uh, shrinking membership, less income, whether it be from uh, uh, dues that are paid every year to help support uh, the lodge in which you're a member of, or if it's uh, uh, shrinking uh, finances due to lack of volunteers and lack of ability to hold things like fundraisers that help with the uh, maintenance on the, these Masonic lodges. A lot of these items become deferred maintenance and pile up and help push um, many Masonic lodges out of these um, older buildings and some of these more grand buildings. Thus was the case here in Oklahoma City. You'll see there on the left, that top left is was an artist's rendition of what uh, the new Oklahoma City Lodge looked like. Below it is a picture of the actual lodge. It's still there today, still in use. Um, on the right are, are two um, examples of what Masonic Lodges uh, looked like during this phase. In the 1960s, or the, these two Masonic lodges came out of that same phase in Oklahoma masonry and, and during uh, our fraternity's history. Um, but in smaller towns and on smaller scales, that top lodge is the Colgate Lodge located in Cole County, Oklahoma. The bottom one is Goodwater Masonic Lodge located in Hayworth, Oklahoma. Uh, both of them built out of uh, cinder blocks or cinder block like material. Uh, with the metal roof, uh, very inexpensive uh, method of construction, and also uh, it, more economical uh, when they were built in terms of heating and cooling and uh, modern anemones um, for their fellowship areas. But now, not all lodges that moved during this period um, uh, built their own buildings. I felt it, it kind of interesting to point out uh, when looking at the landscape of, of Oklahoma and, and looking at specifically Masonic Lodges as a part of that, that patchwork, um, it's interesting to notate that some of these lodges are repurposed buildings, such as the case of Broken Bow Lodge, number 441, located in Broken Bow, Oklahoma. On the left-hand side, you see it. Um, that 
building was formerly a uh, grocery store. Uh, the Broken Bow Masonic Lodge moved in there in, in the mid-1950s. On the right, you will see a Google Maps photo of the Antlers Masonic Lodge. Um, and Antlers, Oklahoma, of course, right down the road from their courthouse, the Pushmataha County Courthouse. Uh, that Masonic Lodge, when you uh, go into their lodge hall, uh, you'll notice a difference in the level of floors. That's because formerly cows were milked in that building. It is actually part of an old uh, dairy that was purchased by the Masons there and, and converted over into a Masonic Lodge. So very interesting to visit if you ever have the opportunity. Um, so they, they hold a two-fold uh, historic um, relevance to to that community there. Here's another example of of the uh, movement from which we see uh, these Masonic lodges leave uh, these older and, and downtown uh, and more grand buildings for in search of something more modern and economical. Thus was the case with the Idabel Masonic Lodge in the early 1970s moved to this building from uh, which they had constructed to replace their uh, former three-story building that we showed earlier, that red building that we showed earlier in the presentation. Um, of course, again, uh, in search of a more economical way to heat and cool um, their lodge space uh, in search of uh, more comfort in some cases, uh, in some cases, in search of more um, uh, flexibility in terms of being able to add on and expand, uh, in some cases to make their lodges more uh, user friendly, more tailored to their their specific needs, um, and uh, of course also uh, trying to escape things like replacing mortar and bricks and. Um, uh, massive roof re-roofing projects um, that it, coupled with the shrinkage of Masonic membership really pushed a lot of these lodges out of those great and grand uh, historic buildings and into these more modern ones which are now historic in their their own right. Here are two more examples of more modernly constructed uh, Masonic Lodges that, that came out of that same shift in Oklahoma Masonry. Uh, McLeod Masonic Lodge, they're in McLeod, Oklahoma, and Alva Masonic Lodge, they're in Alva. Example, streamlined for its time, uh, Masonic Lodge. And then, of course, uh, you have uh, metal buildings serving as Masonic Lodges. Um, a good example of that then at the bottom Boswell Masonic Lodge it's a good example of a, a small town rural lodge uh, where its members are are simply uh, seeking to uh, construct a meeting space that is functional for them and um, uh, does what it needs to do for for the purpose they need to do it uh, same goes for Yukon Masonic Lodge number 90 there in Yukon uh, both uh, really good examples of, of these Masonic uh, lodges uh, as a membership base seeking to replace their buildings with something more economical, more modern, and easier to take care of. Um, there are several of these scattered all throughout the state of Oklahoma. By far, uh, if if I was to suggest a visit to one, it would be the Hevener Masonic Lodge in LaFleur County. Um, it is one of my favorite lodges in the entire state. And um, I can appreciate a metal building, but uh, I'll, I'll let you know a little bit of my personal preference, I guess, and, and say that I don't prefer one. I can appreciate one, but I don't prefer one necessarily. Well, Hevener Masonic Lodge is very unique. And it's because of the efforts that the brethren there have and the membership there have put into that building. They left a downtown uh, building, much like the old Masonic Hall in uh, downtown Atoka. And they uh, built for them a, a new metal building. But when they left, they stripped the interior of their old lodge hall, took with them the flooring, the light fixtures, 
the officer stations and, and platforms and all the furniture of the lodge and brought it back to that metal building and within that those metal walls reconstructed their old um, historic space of their lodge hall and so uh, when you go to Hevener Masonic Lodge you walk into this metal building and then you walk in and as if you have walked into a 1920s built uh, lodge hall it's very neat if you ever get the opportunity to visit I strongly suggest it um, and like I said, this is this is a basic rundown of the transformation that our Masonic lodges as building them, buildings themselves have taken over the years. Of course, like I said earlier, every one of them is just as unique as a personal story. Uh, each each lodge is different. Uh, it's made different by its membership. It's made different by their abilities, by their wants, by their needs. It's made different by uh, local materials and labor and skills made available to its membership and the finances of its membership. They're all contributing factors in what shapes the, the look, feel, and ex of a Masonic Lodge. Um, but my hope in, uh, in this presentation is that as you travel this great state of ours, and you take inventory of the historic space around you, um, pay attention to the Masonic Lodges. They're a very important uh, uh, part of our uh, communal history as, as the people of the state of Oklahoma, uh, and they have lent uh, a lot to uh, the culture of Oklahoma and especially the, the uh, cultural landscape of Oklahoma. So uh, I hope uh, if anything else, this has sparked you to to dig further in Masonic history, if that's your interest, or in the history of these Masonic lodges. Um, there are some great resources out there to do so. Um, one social media page, uh, again, uh, Oklahoma Masonic History by T.S. Akers. It's a, a great Masonic history page at, that you can go and like and follow and, and see what he researches and shares there. Another great resource is the Museum and Library of the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma that's located at our Grand Lodge building in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Uh, and they, but we have a museum there and a research library. It, it's a great place to visit. Lots of uh, uh, great Masonic uh, items there and items that tell the history of masonry in Oklahoma, which isn't done anywhere else in the world. And uh, we should all be proud to, to have that institution there. Um, and uh, if you're interested in supporting uh, them and supporting the preservation of Masonic history in the state of Oklahoma, um, I, I do pitch to you that uh, the, the Library and Museum of the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma is hosting a capital campaign, and we would be glad to uh, receive some of your support.